could see like you, you've never seen before those children, isn't it? You see things and you can see what God is up to. God wants to expand you and to grow you and to place us and see things that you never dreamt about. That's the kingdom of God. That's new birth equals change of eyes. Your spiritual world, you, you can see what's going on. Now, because we are raised in a very good kind of world where everything is um, thought through and analysed and, uh, you know, all that sort of stuff, I share this morning that I'm not sure if I share with you about what happens to me in the song. So I go back, I've got on my knees, and, you know, when I try to analyse it, really, I told you about it. And my, I went through a transformation of thought because I put my mind under God's authority, and I started to have visions and dreams in a new way, because I, the, the balance sort of shifted. When, when I went to Bible college, I was kind of above the Bible, <laughs> but we need to come under the Bible and let the Bible speak to us, so it's a, a, a slight shift. But the second thing that happens is that we will say and hence the body, um, if I can make this thing work. So we can see it. Now that we can see what God's doing, we enter in under it. We're in the kingdom. And uh, the whole theme in the New Testament, uh, particularly the Gospels, is about the kingdom of God coming willingly in submission and surrender under the authority of King Jesus. That's true. So the only way to get under is to repent. That's why Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of God is near. John the Baptist, the kingdom of God is near. So we come under authority. So he's the king, I am his subject. He's the shepherd, I am his sheep. He's the teacher, I am his student. So he has absolute authority so I can see now like I've never seen before. The Lord Jesus said, in regard to demonization, if by the finger of God that I cast out, cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come among you. Remember that? It's the invasion of King Jesus into spirit world that was causing so many problems. So entering in is critical, then you can see. But we need to be born again. And so the whole thing that this morning was very much entering into a new space and then God can do extraordinary things. And so when I yielded, 1973 to let Jesus be the king, that's when stuff started to happen. Prior to that, I struggled in evangelism. I was always concerned about what people thought about me. But I'm telling you, it liberated me. So I just needed to follow the prompts of the king. He was the leader, I was the follower. So he prompted me, I tried it, I didn't always get it right. And sometimes uh, we don't as we learn on the way. Okay? But I kind of feel that this your theme for this weekend is that God wants to give expansion to you. He wants to, to reveal himself so that you can do far more. He will do far more exceeding, that's proportionately, but also in every other way more than you could ever ask for a man. I, you know, I shared a little this morning, you know, when I went through high school, um, I didn't do well. No, I'm sorry. Uh, I played the straight into his footy. Uh, we had migrated from England, and I could see the only way that I could really be accepted here was to be good at sport. So I let all my studies go, and I failed uh, high school, grade 10. But um, I realized how gracious God was because, you know, just before I set for my grade 10 exams, I went with my father to one of those vocational guidance. Nights. You know that they run in school, but they still do them. You go along and find out what kind of career path. So we're wandering, I'm wandering around with my dad. I'm 16 years of age, I'm all dance, and um, just speaking that thing, that thing. And we're going to all the different booths and learning about building architecture, every kind of conceivable thing. But I just loved aeroplanes, so that's what I love. And the final uh, booth that we came to, room, was the aviation. <coughs> so, I, I said, Dad, come on, let's go in here. This is pretty exciting. So I went in and I said to this guy who had his shoulders were kind of dripping with all the, you know, what do you call the epaulets with all the stripes and bars on it. I said, excuse me, sir, sir uh, what qualifications would it be for me to become a pilot? 
And the guy said, well, you need maths one and two in matriculation. You need English and science and physics. I said, it's been nice talking to you. <laughs> I made my way to the door. I said, well, I can't do that one. And I got to the door, and there was this, oi! Like a real loud cry. And it startled me. I turned around, and he said, yes, you young man, just come here. So I came up, wondering what I thought this was about. He said, what do you buy with your hands? I said, sir, I like fixing things. I like doing things and all that sort of stuff. He said, well, listen, we're going to start an engineering department with our company. You might want to think about becoming our first apprentice maintenance aircraft maintenance engineer. I said, me? He said, well, give it a shot. You bring your results in when you, uh, when you finish your exams and you come and have a chat and we'll see how we go and this thing you do as our first apprentice. So I sat for my exams and I got my results back and I passed woodwork and metalwork. There were two subjects. Did excellent in those two subjects that I really didn't show up. So what did I do? I went back to Nowesca Aviation in Kalgoorlie. I went into the office. I said, oh, sir, his name was Jan Beers, a Dutchman. I said, sir, I'm ready to start. He said, well, how did you get on? And I said, well, not as good as I expected. He said, well, can you tell me what, what that looks like? I said, well, I've enlisted in night school. He said, what did you do that for? I said, well, sir, to be very honest, uh, I didn't do very well at all. He said, tell me, what did you do? I said, I got good work and never work. He said, we can't employ you. You go back and get your grade 10 and we'll consider you as our first aircraft maintenance engineer apprentice. I walked away very dejected and wondering what I was going to do with my life. But I went back a week later and I knocked on the door. I said, I'm back again. I'm ready to start. He said, we had a conversation last week. You go away and get your qualifications and then come back. I went back the third week and he was getting really aggro by the state. He says, what are you doing here? I said, sir, I can guarantee I'll be the very best aircraft maintenance engineer. But I'll be the very best guy you've ever employed. Something to that effect. He said, young man, go away and do not come back until you have your qualifications. I went back the next week. <laughs> he said, you've got the job. <laughs> and that opened the door and, and it was just incredible that God's place gave me that role. And I went on to become a licensed engineer. But there's something extraordinary about God and his kingdom, how he operates. And it's an operation by faith, and we just move with him, and we grow with him, and we expand with him. And it was beyond my wildest dreams that when we allow God into the picture, he can do the miracle. And I just kind of sense that God wants to open our eyes to see more, and we need to enter more into what God is doing. Uh, it's good that we're part of uh, solution part of the problem and it's a problem ever I want to just give you a few things from the Bible tonight about going deeper and wider. So turn in your scriptures in your Bible to Ezekiel 47. Ezekiel chapter 47. And uh, am I doing it right without this microphone? Better with it. Better with it. Ezekiel 47, it's in the Old Testament, page 987. Ezekiel 47, how to go deeper and wider, seeing the kingdom of God expand. And uh, Jesus said uh, in his prayer, let your kingdom come, let your will be done. So we want to be part of some great expansion. <laughs> You're mucking me up, aren't you? Ezekiel 47. I wish I had one of those little things that go on your neck. Not a noose either. Ezekiel 47. The man brought me back to the entrance of the temple, and I saw water coming out from under the threshold of the temple towards the east. For the temple faced east in his hand, he measured off a thousand cubits, and then led me through water that was ankle deep. 
He measured off another thousand cubics and led me through water that was knee deep. He measured off another thousand and led me through water that was up to the waist. He measured off another thousand, but now it was a river that I could not cross because the water had risen and was deep enough to swim in, a river that, that, that no one could cross. He asked me, son of man, do you see this? Then he led me back to the bank of the river. When I arrived there, I saw a great number of trees on each side of the river. He said to me, this water flows towards the eastern region, goes down to the Arabah, where it enters the sea. When it empties into the sea, the water there becomes fresh. Swarms of living creatures will live wherever the river flows. There will be large numbers of fish because this water flows there and makes the salt water fresh. So where the river flows, everything will live. Fishermen will stand among the shore from Engedi to Engleam. There will be the places for spreading of nets. The fish will be of many kinds, like the fish of the great sea. But the swamps and the marshes will not become fresh. They will be left for salt. Fruit trees of all kinds will grow on both banks of the river. Their leaves will not wither, nor will their fruit fail. Every month they will bear because the water from the sanctuary flows to them. Their fruit will serve for food and their leaves for healing. And let's just pray before we look at this passage. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are the king of the kingdom. We're very glad that your kingdom is coming. It's expanding every day. And we want to have everything under your authority. We want all of our habits under authority. We want all of our thoughts under authority. We want all of our attitudes under authority. We want our bodies under authority. We want our money under authority. Because you're the king and we are your subjects. It's a joy to be in the kingdom. And we thank you, Lord, that you touch our eyes so we can see. See things that we've never seen before. And we enter into a dimension of life that's absolutely supernatural. Release us, Lord, from anything that keeps us back from seeing anything less than what you have. Because you can do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we could ever ask or imagine. Lord Jesus, we're not here to talk just about uh, facts in the Bible. We're here to live it. We don't just want to just uh, pour over the scriptures and say, great idea, great concept. We want to live it. And so, Father, I commend us to you tonight that we will be able to engage with you in a kingdom-expanding sort of mindset. There is nothing too hard for the Lord. You can take our weaknesses and make them strong. You can take our small things and grow them into big things. So I ask, Lord, if there's anybody here who's still struggling with inferiority, struggling with insecurity, struggling with insignificance, in Jesus' name, we want to see each of those eyes bent into a sea. So, Father, we pray that you would deliver us, Lord, from small-mindedness, from any pessimism, unbelief, or pride. We want to just please you because we trust you. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. So we give you all the glory and all the honor and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. I do have a, a strong sense in my heart that God wants to create expansion. And um, I, I want to just bring some thoughts from the scripture uh, that might help you as an expanding capacity people. Uh, that God would just take you on this, not just for Teen Street, but you'll just be a a very influential person. Uh, we know that the kingdom of God is very influential. Uh, it's the gospel of the kingdom. Uh, that's the theme of even the sower. It's the gospel of the kingdom and the four seeds, uh, the four soils rather, uh, receive the gospel of the kingdom with a different outcome. But I want to just refer to just a few things also, uh, out of this. Uh, and the first thing from, uh, from Ezekiel is that I'd like to talk about the source of going deeper and wider. What is the source? And in the first uh, two verses, I want to itemize three things about going deeper and wider. Because God is an expanding God. There's nothing too hard for him. 
And I look back over my life now since I walked into that room uh, in that high school in Kelgoli and what God has done with my smallness, with my littleness, with my failure. My, what can he do? <laughs> David, what do you have in your hand? Oh, it's just a little slingshot. Give the slingshot to me, David, and we'll deal with that Goliath. He's too big to miss. We know why he got five stones. It wasn't because he was a bad shot. It's just that Goliath had four brothers. You know, God can take your little things and he can do amazing. Whether it's a little boy's lunch. And I believe God wants to create expansion here. Broaden your concept of how big God is. The first thing is the source of going deeper and wider in this kingdom expanding ministry. The first thing that we notice in the text here is the temple. Now the temple in the Old Testament was a symbol of the, pre of the presence of God. Of course, uh, Solomon built the temple and in 2 Chronicles chapter 7 we find out what happened after, at the end of his prayer after he dedicated the temple and the presence of God came and filled the temple with fire and the presence of God filled the temple. It was a symbol of presence. So when the uh, when they went up to their festivals, they would sing their great songs of ascent. You know, I lift up my eyes to the hills from whence my help comes. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. What were they singing about? It was the temple. Because Jerusalem was high in its elevation. Uh, you know, and they would walk up the hills and they would sing as families. And the songs of ascent are found from Psalm 120. Uh, to 134, there's uh, quite a few of them, 14 songs of ascent. But it was about the temple. And so in, the, in a biblical New Testament concept, your body now is the temple of the Holy Spirit. We're going to um, have a look at um, a New Testament scripture there uh, to identif identify that. And I've just completely lost it. But there you go. <laughs> It's 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Would someone like to look at that scripture? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Someone who finds it, just read it out. And, uh, Don't you know that there is in this house of the Bible and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys the body, God's temple will not destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred, and you together are the same isn't that extraordinary that your body now is the house of God? And so therefore, we need to keep our temple clean. In the Old Testament, when revival was needed, it was usually uh, because the temple had become uh, desecrated. Josiah, that young king, that great, that lovely <laughs> king who became king at eight years of age and uh, you know, encountered God at, at 16 and then at 21, he consecrated the temple to God. He cleansed the temple and found the scriptures in the temple. It was so filthy and so unclean. And God brought a revival under his jurisdiction and under uh, Hezekiah as well. But the question I want to ask you tonight is, how is your temple? You see, your temple is the dwelling place of God. That's where God lives. He doesn't live in a building. He lives in you. And so the source of going deeper and wider it's your body, it's the presence of God that dwells inside of you. And, and I just encourage you, young people, keep your body clean. The quickest way to defile your temple is through your eye gate. For the eyes are the window of the soul. And so we live in a very, very sort of stimulated society. It's almost an over-sexualized society. Images and pictures all over the place. And uh, we can be defiled so very quickly. And so we need to guard and keep our bodies clean because that's where God dwells. And I believe that there are many rooms inside the temple that need to be cleaned. Sometimes we get defiled in some different ways, the way that we think, the way that we act, and so on. But the question I ask you tonight is how is your temple? We need to do house cleaning really well. And one of the ministries that I find myself doing a lot these days is because some of the rooms have become contaminated. We need to go into that room. And one of the strategic ways 
uh, particularly for young men anyway, is the whole area of pornography and how a room can be invaded by stuff and it becomes very addictive. And that will spoil that sacred room that's been designed just for one day if you're to be married, for your wife to live there along with the Lord Jesus. It's that beautiful sacred space that God has ordained for intimacy and for closeness. And, uh, but it often becomes defiled. And, and it's like a rampant uh, plague that is sweeping across the church and across the world. And it doesn't take much for defilement to take place. Uh, and uh, we can be defiled in many different kinds of ways. And it spoils the work of the kingdom. But I need to come with that and place it under the authority of the king. And I uh, personally use the scripture... Uh, from 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, that says, The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the casting down of strongholds, casting down every imagination, pictures in the mind, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. You can never have intimacy with God whilst there's domination of a stronghold. And the question I ask you young people tonight is there a stronghold? Is there a room that's been corrupted? It defiles you. It's like a broken down record and it just keeps playing over and over again. God, I believe, wants to make our temples clean. That's the source of going deeper and wider. And uh, tonight we want to just kind of have a ministry time uh, that we might be able to deal with some areas in our lives that are holding us back. Um, someone has said, you are what you repeatedly do. If you want to know who you are, look at what you re do repeatedly. That defines who you are. Okay? So your body is strategic in the work of the Holy Spirit. It's His dwelling place. And so uh, if there's something that needs to be cleansed, we want to invite Jesus to come. And the final outcome is that we will have knowledge of God. And maybe when you come to worship, you struggle to break through because you've got these thoughts or whatever challenges that's going on inside of you that holds you back. Uh, then we need to make confession. The Bible says, He that conceals his sin will never prosper, but he that confesses it and renounces it will find mercy. So there's great power in confession. And I really value your generation because you generation, you young people, uh, generally the ones that I work with are very honest about life. And so we just need to deal with issues. Don't hold it as a secret. The devil will hold you captive. He loves secrets. We say, this is our own secret. And so I've met people who've been Christians for many years, dragging their, themselves around because of what happened some time ago, some years back in their journey. Uh, don't let things uh, remain unconfessed. Uh, revival has always begun with prayer and confession. It's good to confess. And uh, I, I, I just encourage you tonight, we're going to do business with God. If there's something that you're struggling with, let's let the king take control of his kingdom, of the dominion, and drive out anything that may have corrupted you. If you've come a little bit, sort of, a bit, sort of feeling like you've failed and fallen short, let the Lord Jesus come. Make it clean. Make it clean. Once the temple is clean, then we come to the second part of the story here, of the source, and that's the water. It flowed out from the temple, and the water is a symbol of power. In the Bible, uh, water was a symbol of the Holy Spirit. So when Jesus stood up and spoke to that large crowd in John chapter 7, the crowd out, cried out with a loud voice, all these religious people at this, you know, at the Feast of Booze. If anybody is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. For he who believes in me out of his being, you know, uh, rivers of water will flow. And so the water is a symbol of power. So once the temple is clean, 
Once it's empty, we can never be filled unless we're empty. And so the strategic point in my life was, Graham, I cannot use you because I do not own you. You give me ownership, Graham, and I'll do the miracle because it's not by might, it's not by power, it's by my spirit. Let me do it through you, Graham. And so we come and say, yes, Lord, my temple is clean. I want you to come now and fill me with your power. Your, your, come and anoint me with the Holy Spirit. Take control of me. To be filled means to be controlled. And so the second step in this journey of going deeper and expanding wider is to recognize that God dwells inside of me. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is now living in me. This is supernatural. This is powerful. This is kingdom advanced stuff. And so then we come and we ask him to fill us. I remember D.L. Moody, you know, that, old, that evangelist from the 1850s, and came to him and said, Mr. Moody, why do we need to be filled with the Spirit? He said, because we leak. That's why. <laughs> I don't know. not sure if the anal analogy is right. But we just need his anointing. We need his power. The Lord Jesus, at the time of his baptism, had that little dove have come from heaven and settle upon him. And that anointed him for ministry. And he went to Nazareth and said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Young people, you cannot do kingdom stuff unless you have kingdom power. Until he has control over you, to be filled means to be controlled. So we come to this going deeper, going wider, that that's with the kingdom. Is that I need to dedicate my temple to God. My eyes, and usually what I do is I just bow to the top of my head and I go right to my feet and say, Lord, it's all good. My body is yours. Thank you that you want to live inside of me. How amazing is that? You want to take up residence inside of me. That's what the Lord Jesus said. If you, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. And we will come and make our home with you. That's intimacy. The number two, the water, is the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to know the anointing every day. Lord Jesus, I can't. You never said I could, but you can and always said you would. And I wondered. The third thing, as we look at the source, is that yes, we need to recognize that God lives in, a, in, in our bodies. It's beautiful, isn't it? But it needs to be clean. It's the Holy Spirit that lives in a holy place. Uh, we need the scrutiny of the Holy Spirit to bring, shine His light into areas that may be gray. And, and uh, we need holiness. Without holiness, we cannot see the Lord. Sometimes we get a torrent that will rose. But I pray that my conscience will be so quickened that if I see something, I'll walk away. Something comes up on television, we'll turn it off. And uh, if we're in a theater, if you go to movies, or something, and a scene comes up, up and go. I know we did that as a family. Once. <laughs> we haven't seen this. I forget what movie it was. Dan, do you remember? When you were allowed. It was allowed. <laughs> Spirit, you have to ask the question, what would Jesus do? Is this happy Jesus and you happy living inside of me? What do you think? Jesus living inside of me, you happy to go there? Can you hear what I'm saying? And young people, I say to you, and the Lord, if you press upon me, when we get a group of people 
who has submitted to the king completely with all that has, he will have revival. You know, when, when the Lord Jesus was baptized, it, he did it to fulfill all righteousness. And when you come and surrender, and you get a group of surrendered people, even if it's just a few, there's a dimension of power that will happen through you. Because it's under his control. So you go where he goes, you do what he does, you say what he says, that's the kingdom. The kingdom of God, like righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And so we come to that temple to say, Lord Jesus, is everything right with my hands? Is everything right with my heart? Have I thought something? And if you have to repeat kind of stuff, keep going, I would say that the problem. If it keeps regurgitating itself over and over again, I would say it's either the beginnings of stronghold or a developed stronghold. If you are constantly struggling with one particular area of life, I would say it could develop into a stronghold. And we need to call it by its proper name, man. Jesus' name, get rid of it. Let the Holy Spirit invade that space. Because the fruit of the Spirit will then become evident in you. Is that true? Love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, self-control, all those great attributes. Let's come to the final one because we want to get to the source. We want to move to the source, and it has to do with the altar. And the altar is a symbol of praise. And when the when the temple is filled with the with the spirit, I tell you what, you will not be able to contend with this one. In fact, in Ephesians five eighteen, it says, "Do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs." And making melodies in your heart to the Lord. And it's the song that comes out of you. It's evidence that the Holy Spirit is in you. Remember that old chorus. Some of you who are a little bit older might remember. Joy is the flag flown high from the castle. Does anybody know that one? Three of you, four of you. Okay. Joy is the flag flown high from the castle of my heart. That the king is in his residence there. It's the overflow. It's the joy that's expressed through you. In God's presence, there's fullness of joy. So when you're filled with the Spirit, you'll have a joy about you. You'll have a you, you just will want to dance. I, I learned to dance in the Solomon Islands. I, I was at the revival camp. I had really young people. I saw God come down in a very demonstrative way. I was so overawed. I was <coughs> Thank you. 
destiny, and everybody said, Amen. God wanted you to be born. You were a very strategic person. Can I get you to say something to me? I'm a very strategic person. Did you say that? I'm a very strategic person. Now I'm not in school right now, but it's a very nice thing to say. Because you are. God wanted you to be born. Your, your day of your birth was ordained by God. And you're alive at this time for a very special reason. It's to see the kingdom expand. But you've got to go deeper to get to, get to go, go wider. So we come with our temples. We say, Lord Jesus, my body is yours. And you say, but Graham, you know, to be very honest, there's some stuff in the corner. I need to do some house cleaning, and tonight we're going to do it. We're going to call sing fires for its proper name, for whatever it is, because it's, we cannot afford not to deal with it. Is that true? Now, I'm not disappointed with judgmental thing. I hope you're not feeling like you're under a pump here, like you're going to, you don't have to go looking for anything. The Holy Spirit's a very good, <laughs> a very good, uh,
He said, where are you going to go for your honeymoon? I said, I don't know. He said, where would you like to go? I said, you know, I'd like to take my bride back to where I was born. He said, consider it done. I'll fix it for you. Here I was after two years of Bible college and I was not going to eat. And my boss was giving me a couple of pictures. It's lovely to wait. It's not an easy thing to wait. Because then you leave, and you clean, and then you become one flesh. And you can walk together. You can wonder what it's going to be to you. So that's the source of going deeper and wider. And I, I know it's a challenge in this current day. We've got to walk in purity. The second thing that Jesus talks about going about deeper and deeper and deeper and wider is there are four strategic steps. And some of you perhaps are still on the bank here. But the four steps are ankle deep, knee deep, waist deep, and then swimming. Some of you are dead set scared, perhaps, of stepping out. You struggle with fear. You struggle with letting go. But when God calls, you go. That's the nature of the kingdom. He's the king. You are his subject. You're going to leave the bank. And some of you are anchored to the bank. You look at the water. You see some people going up and having a go. Say, so that's not me. I'm just too scared. Well, thank God you're here for this weekend. Amen? Because you're going to be pushed into the deep water. I just love taking young people with me. I just took uh, John, I, uh, sorry, Sam, so there's Sam Redmond, I don't know if he's here somewhere, and Sam Slater, and a whole bunch of these young folks that we did just a few months ago. And it's just a joy to push these young men out in the deep water and see them trust God to the outcomes. And to consider the body of the bank. What does it mean to be an ankle deep Christian? An ankle deep Christian is someone who's learning how to walk in the Spirit. Romans chapter 8 talks about that, doesn't it? It's, it says, um, it gives us that strong encouragement in Romans, Romans chapter 8 and verse 14. Well, someone like to read that verse. Romans 8 verse 14. Just read it out once you find it. Just read it out. That's good. Somebody? Just one other time. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. So our feet just simply go where God goes. We just walk where He walks and do what He does. God's got no plan B. You're it. He ain't going to send the angels to do it for you. For me. It's your feet. So you leave the bank by faith. And some of you are going to leave the bank and prep it. Maybe just leaving your chair and coming and standing at the front or kneeling here tonight. It's your way of saying, I'm going to go. I, I just want to walk with God. You know, I love uh, that, that statement about it, Enoch, you know. He walked with God and he got to. Just walking with God. And your feet become his feet. Listen to the Spirit. Those who are led by the Spirit are sons of God. We just go where He goes. It's not complicated. It is costly. And uh, I've given you so many. Well, anyway, you know, you know how it is. Just listen. Develop a listening ear. I, I started to listen to God. I don't know how it happened. I was making a debate in the church. And, and um, in our church, we, you know, some of you are familiar with the gospel wall. Scripture, and that's, that's where everybody sat, waited 
just listening to God, developing a listening ear. Number two, leads, praying in the Spirit. You know, it's developing that intellect that he says we prayer. Ephesians chapter 6, praying all kinds in the Spirit, with all kinds of prayers. It may not be a shopping list style of prayer, but God's doing something in heaven and he's dropping it into you. If you feel burdened for somebody and you're starting to engage in prayer and you're, you know, wrestling in prayer like one of the, I forget who it was in the New Testament, it was in uh, it was Colossians. I forget that guy's name, but he's been wrestling in prayer for you. Remember that guy? Anyway, oh look, it's a dear prayer warrior praying in the spirit. Are you there yet? Is he walking in the spirit? Are you praying in the spirit? Having the Holy Spirit to give you power to know how to pray, because without him we can do nothing. Thirdly, the way to person is a kind of reproductive sort of area is to witness in the spirit. It's just being in the spirit to talk about Jesus. And Jesus said to the disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. You'll just talk about me all the time. What a great person to talk about. Just to talk about Jesus, you know, to preach the life of people, but to talk about Jesus. What is done in your life? Constantly with authority and with power in a compelling way. So we start with our feet, we move to our knees, we go to our ways because we begin to speak like the early church did. They told not to speak, they said we can't help it. <laughs> and then we come to swim. Swimming in spirit needs to be a glow. To be, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, right at the end of that passage, it says that we are being transformed from one glory to another by the Spirit. Your face will be a glow with the glory of God. And that's how Moses was when he came down from the mountain to shine for the glory of God. Can I ask you? Which level do you pay yourself at? Sit on the back? Do you move to your feet? Are you walking in the spirit? Are you listening? When down to your knees, praying in the spirit, growing in the air. I'm not talking about perfection. Just available under the king. The king comes and gives you these things to do. Then you start witnessing the spirit. Just go across there. Speak over there. Drop this thing there. Or whatever you've got to do. It will be very different for all of us. And then you just
Lord Jesus. 